Seven my years ago, when my little daughter Zinzi was about six years, she was playing outside, and then she came into the house and said, "Mummy, you say Daddy is is uh, in prison because he is fighting for uh, the black people." I said, "Yes, Daddy." And then uh, she, she said, uh, "But now you say." All, all the black men fight for the black people so that they should have all the things the whites have in this country, isn't it? I answered her. I said, yes. And then she said, but next door, mommy, their father is there at home. Uh, why is my father in jail and not the father next door? In our sick society, when a man hasn't been to prison, you look twice at that black man. How is it possible that in racist South Africa he hasn't been to prison? It means there is something wrong with that man. The Africans require want the franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. They want political independence. For seeking democratic rights for most of the people in South Africa, Nelson Mandela has been in jail since 1962. During those long years, he has come increasingly to be represented by his wife, Winnie. Our leaders called on President Botha to remove violence to free all those who have been imprisoned and to allow the return of all those who have been driven into exile. To unban the People's Organization, the African National Congress, to dismantle apartheid, to allow free political activity so that the people may decide who will govern. We call upon the world to accept these demands. Joined by their marriage vows, which the might of a police state could not put asunder, Winnie and Nelson Mandela have forged their union into an unflinching challenge to white supremacy. Namzamo Winifred Matakazela came to Johannesburg in the mid-50s. She was fresh from the countryside, a brilliant student newly graduated as a social worker. I dealt mostly with children. I handled the worst of our malnutrition cases. I dealt with hunger, with poverty directly. I was involved with my community at grassroots level. And it was one of the most painful things for me to be in touch with the reality of our country's problems. Mm -hmm. The rife unemployment, the poverty of the people and the fact that there was no way of changing those conditions other than changing the whole status quo. There were socioeconomic problems of a depraved society. To change these conditions, the leading black liberation organization, the African National Congress, had begun a mass movement of civil disobedience, defying the laws of racial superiority called apartheid. Carried out with a Gandhian commitment to nonviolence, this defiance campaign brought to prominence a young leader of the African National Congress, the lawyer Nelson Mandela. In Johannesburg, everybody was talking about this man. In the evenings when the factory workers came from work, they would sing freedom songs and invariably all these freedom songs were about Mandela. The factory workers sang so affectionately of this man. When they talked of better wages at work, they would say, Mandela will get us better wages. He seemed to be the solution to each and every worker's problems. Just about everything they wanted to complain about to their employers, they would mention this Mandela and the African National Congress.
Winnie Matakazela was the first black social worker to be attached to a hospital, Soweto's Baragwanath. One day, I was at work at Baragwanath Hospital, and I got a call from a man who introduced himself over the phone as Nelson Mandela. Uh, he said he wanted to uh, see me and discuss certain issues with me. I was petrified. I was so shocked at uh, receiving that call. Um, I wondered what I had done. Um, then on the appointed day we met and it transpired he wanted me to help raise funds for the then prison trial. To crush the new spirit of black protest, the South African government had rounded up 156 opponents of apartheid and charged them with high treason. This was the largest of many political trials designed to suppress dissent. Among those on trial in 1956 was Nelson Mandela. An international campaign was launched to raise money for the defense and to support the families of the accused. Nelson involved Winnie in this effort. That is how I met my husband and the relationship between us grew and it was no longer just the relationship of a social worker attorney who was involved in the prison trial at the time. Winnie came to visit us before she was married to Nelson. So she came as a very young woman, very much in love with Nelson, carrying photographs of him as a boxer in the ring, actually boxing very proud of his physical prowess. That was my first meeting with Winnie, a very young Winnie. Involved in the treason trial, his legal practice and ANC organizing, Nelson proposed by asking Winnie to find a dressmaker to make a wedding dress. In accordance with Kosa custom, the first part of the wedding ceremony had to take place at Winnie's parental home, Pondoland on the south coast. Pondoland is a stronghold of the Matakazelas, Lenny's family name. There are said to be 3,000 Matakazelas, all related. When we got married, in fact, the congregation sang the hymn Liza Lisi Tengalako. That was the only way the Pondos showed their appreciation of the marriage. This song is a pean to the beauty of the homeland. But homeland for Winnie's father meant only that region where he lived. For Nelson, it meant the whole of South Africa. Politics would later cause a painful break for Winnie between her father and her husband. There is what we call in Tosa Guiam, um, where elders uh, come and give you the last wise words as a young bride and tell you how you should conduct yourself when you get to the other side and that when you join that other family uh, you must join it and do as Rome does. My father said to me I must remember that I am marrying the struggle and not the man and that by virtue of my bringing such a man to him as a son-in-law was in fact introducing the African National Congress to that part of our country. Mandela believed, as he put it, the struggle is my life. A few months after her wedding, Winnie was swept into the struggle on the issue of women's rights. Up to this time, African women had been exempted from carrying the hated passbooks which control the lives of their menfolk from the age of 16 to death, dictating where they may live and work in their own country. Now the government forced passes on women too. 
In their thousands, they were forced to line up to be photographed. There are few black men who have not been in prison for past offenses. The extension of passes to the black women confirmed that the black woman would be similarly subjected to harassment and imprisonment because of past offenses. and uh, people were arrested and filled the jail. And Winnie was one of those people that were arrested. She was expectant with her first child at the, uh, that time. And even in that state, she went to jail. The prison was crowded. There were no special facilities for political prisoners. We were all just thrown together with other prisoners. We slept on the floor. We were just each given two blankets and a mat, and that was all. So that was just my initiation. The life I've led from that moment has always been in and out of prisons. I can no longer even remember how many times I've been arrested and how many times I've been actually jailed. There have been too many. For African women, the oppression is twofold. Struggle against apartheid and the struggle of the black woman as a woman first in society and as an oppressed woman by the racist regime. We are prisoners of our own culture. Black woman has had to battle all the way to fight against the oppression of her as a human being, to fight against the dominance culturally in a traditional society where the black woman's position is in fact at home. And at the same time, she has had to emerge as the pillar in that uh, society where she is deprived of the head of the family for very many reasons as a result of the country's laws. The black woman in the rural areas who has had to live year in and year out without her husband sees the husband when uh, he comes home for a week or two or a month. The system of contract labor in South Africa forces black workers to be away from home for years at a time, virtually destroying family life. The struggle for black rights kept Mandela away from home most of the time. Devoted to her husband and looking to him as head of the family, when he felt Nelson's absence keenly. My husband was never there when both children were born. He was either in prison or out gathering information about their prison trial. I never even as much as heard him address a single meeting. He never discussed anything political with me. I'm not his political product, actually. I've never been, I never had an opportunity to be one. It is the African National Congress that has made me what I am. It was, in fact, the Women's League that uh, organized the anti-pass campaign. Um, it was the Women's League that uh, rallied around and organized demonstrations against uh, high rents against high buffers, uh, bread and butter issues that really were dealt with by, by the mothers and by the trade unions mostly. Um, the Women's League was more of a, a workers' organization, the female section of the African National Congress. Within a very short time, Winnie had advanced to a leading position within the Women's League of the African National Congress and the Federation of South African Women. Then came Sharpville. In 1960, the authorities showed how far they were prepared to go to stop the struggle for civil rights. 
At Sharpeville, police fired into a crowd of unarmed demonstrators, killing 69, including women and children. After Sharpeville, South Africa would be, in Nelson's words, more and more ruled by the gun. The government used Sharpeville for further repression. The African National Congress was banned, which made Mandela's political activities illegal. The women's organizations also suffered. All this time, almost five years, the treason trial with Mandela as one of the chief accused had been going on. In 1961, the trial came to an end. All of the accused were found not guilty. Through an oversight on the part of the authorities, Mandela was released to full political activity. He knew he didn't have much time. The day the trial came to an end, the leaders of the African National Congress came home. They came to celebrate the results of, of the trial and the fact that they had been acquitted. My husband did not even enter the house. They were all jubilant and they were standing outside. I still remember very vividly Joe Modise, who is now heading the military wing of the ANC, walked into the house and asked me to pack a few items for my husband. I did, and I gave, I gave him the suitcase. And all I was told was that I'll be seeing him in a few days' time. I never really knew much about his political activities because I think they felt it was better that way. He left with the rest of the leadership that day. And that was the last time I saw my husband at home. When he left with that suitcase, it's when he was going to address that meeting, the big convention in Peter Marysburg. I didn't even know that he was going to be the main speaker there. I saw in the press that he had addressed a meeting, banned as he was, and that after the meeting he had disappeared. When Nelson was uh, underground, this is where the strong woman came out. Her husband was underground, carrying the struggle from underground, and Winnie was left uh, to look no after not only her immediate family, but also Nelson's mother and relatives in the trans sky, and she coped with it very well. Nelson declared, I've had to separate myself from my dear wife and children and live as an outlaw in my own land. Since all open political activity was denied him, Mandela had gone underground to organize a three-day national strike, a stay at home. In spite of Sharpeville, the stay at home was yet another attempt to effect change by peaceful means. The government's reply was again violent. Police and army were mobilized to force people back to work. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against the government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. And I think the time has come for us to consider, in the light of our experiences in this stay at home, whether the methods which we have applied so far are adequate. A half century of nonviolent effort had failed. So a small group was formed under Mandela, which began to bomb symbols of authority, such as power lines and pass offices. Early in 1962, Mandela left South Africa illegally to travel to newly independent African countries, seeking help in training guerrilla squads. This new fighting arm of the African National Congress was called Nkanto Sizwe, Spear of the Nation. When he returned, I also saw him, and um, I was always blindfolded. I never knew exactly where he was. And that was calculated to protect us and the children. We were very small at the time. That was the last time we ever were together as husband and wife. Mandela was the most wanted man in South Africa, the object of a massive manhunt. He must have known that sooner or later he would be caught. 
when he was betrayed by an informer, there was no evidence to link him with sabotage. Instead, for leaving the country illegally and for organizing the 1961 stay at home, he was sentenced to five years. While Mandela was serving this sentence, a small catch of weapons was discovered in Rivonia near Johannesburg. Eight men were arrested, the multiracial high command of Spear of the Nation. Papers were found incriminating a ninth, Mandela. The nine men were charged with the capital crime of sabotage and seeking to overthrow the government by force. Mandela did not deny the charges. Instead, he used the trial as a forum to explain to the world why government repression had left no choice but armed struggle to achieve democracy. The charges carried the death penalty. Until now, Winnie Mandela had been known principally as Nelson's wife. Through her efforts to rally support for the accused, she caught the attention of the media. I normally would have been a very private sort of person to suddenly find myself in the limelight and with the world attention focused on me did make me feel a, a bit uncomfortable. That was the aspect of my life I hadn't anticipated at that stage. Although herself under banning orders, Winnie did not hesitate to fight for her right to attend the trial. The children were refused permission to enter the courtroom. They would not see their father again for over 10 years. With Nelson's mother, Winnie went to hear the verdict. At the trial, Nelson said, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. All but one of the accused were found guilty. The strength of world opinion prevented a sentence of death. Instead, the eight men were sentenced to life imprisonment. Part of my soul did go with him. My husband has been fighting for the liberation of the African people, for the working harmoniously of all the racial groups in this country. I shall never lose hope, and my people shall never lose hope. In fact, we expect that the work will go on. Off Cape Town, Robin Island had been prepared as a maximum security prison to hold a wave of political offenders. Prisoners, kept in appalling conditions, worked in the rock quarries, prey to sadistic guards. Despite these conditions and sealed off from the outside world, Nelson Mandela grew throughout the 60s into the leading symbol of resistance in South Africa. In the early years, Winnie could visit her husband only every six months. For 20 years, they were allowed no bodily contact. Nelson wrote, your love and support is what life and happiness mean to me. Conditions on Robin Island did not break Mandela. As the next battlefield for Nelson's spirit, the government chose the most vulnerable part of him, his wife and family. They hoped to break Nelson by breaking Winnie. Left alone in their house in Soweto, soon not able even to earn a living, Winnie had to endure slanders that it was she who had betrayed her husband to the police. Rumors were put out that she was unfaithful. There were even assassination attempts. The frail wall around the house in Soweto is a symbol of the permanent state of siege endured by the Mandela family. This wall is my little Berlin wall, which was built by several friends as a form of uh, protection, even though really we knew that uh, if they want to do whatever they want to do, they can still do it. Uh, we had had several attempts. There had been several attempts on my life, and friends felt that uh, perhaps this wall could help. Hardest of all for Winnie, 
were the attacks on her through the children. For black children, education has never been a right, but a coveted privilege. We were very young then, and my mother tried getting us into schools in Soweto. And the black principals then were very scared of police harassment. They were afraid to take us because one or two had already experienced, you know, uh, harassment from the security police for having us there. Then we had to use, you know, we changed our surnames and my mother took us to, you know, a colored school um, in town. And there as well, the security police caught up with, you know, with us and, you know, had us kicked out of that school. And this went on and on in about six or seven schools here in South Africa in town, you know where we were just chucked out, you know, we wouldn't even spend a month with the kicked out, you know. Um, until such time that some friends of my mother's heard about our plight and then they offered to have us educated in Swaziland. The children were away at boarding school in a neighboring country, only coming home for vacations. The security branch always arrested me the day my children were on the way back home. They never found me at home. I was never there as a mother to shave them. I was never there as a mother to hold my little girl's hands, take them to school and introduce them to their teachers as is the glory of every mother. You know, when, when your children are starting school, each mother looks forward so much to that day when her little girl is taken to school. I've never entered any of the schools which have been attended by my children. My banning order prevents me from entering educational premises. Under South Africa's peculiar punishment of banning, one's own home may be turned into a prison. Banning restricts most forms of human contact, including work and even religion. Knowing that the attacks on Mandela's family must have a devastating effect on him, the ANC asked Winnie to take the girls and go into exile. An old friend, Paul Joseph, carried the message to her. And Winnie flatly refused to leave the country. She said her place was in the country, her place was in South Africa, and as long as the people were in prison, she could see no reason why she had to leave. Winnie, you see, was left. She had a very short marriage with uh, Nelson in, in, in the context that they lived together as man and wife for a very short period. Uh, she was still very young, in her 20s, when Nelson was taken inside. And she was a social worker. She had a fair job as a social worker. But from the time that Nelson was taken in, Winnie devoted herself entirely to continuing on the outside where Nelson had left off. Despite her banning, you find that Winnie is always getting into trouble with the police, so she is always in the news. It is almost as if she has said to herself that I'm not going to be banned and forgotten. The Mandelas are not going to be forgotten. So she's continued this battle, you know, to keep the Mandelas projected and what they stand for and what they mean for the people alive in the minds of the South African community. She grew to be a very politically dynamic and very, very strong personality. When she spoke, everyone was so quiet just to listen because here was this young, very lovely woman standing up and making her speeches, but she spoke, you know, from her heart, which really made it just wonderful to listen to. She gave inspiration to everybody. Even now, if I have just a telephone call from Winnie, it's something that just gives me so much inspiration that I just want to get out and get that struggle moving, you know, to get back home again. That's the kind of person she is. In 1969, Winnie Mandela was again arrested, this time under the Terrorism Act. 21 others were arrested at the same time, but Winnie was held in solitary confinement for 16 months. When they detained me, I had just been to a heart specialist. I have a heart condition. And the security branch knew that. They knew I had been to, to the doctor. They knew I had been to a heart specialist. And I think they particularly arrested me then because of that knowledge, uh, with the hope that uh, perhaps the condition would worsen in prison. 
and that whatever happened to me would then be attributed to natural causes. The cell in which I was held at the beginning was so small that if I stretched my hands, I touched both walls. I could barely exercise. In, the, in this cell, all I had was a bottle, a plastic bottle with about uh, five glasses of water, a homemade uh, sanitary bucket, and three blankets, and a size I met. That is all besides what I was wearing. Being held in communicado um, is one of the cruelest things any human being can do to another. About a week after I was held, I was transferred to uh, the condemned cell. Cell, a, a condemned cell means uh, a cell that usually holds uh, prisoners who are going to be executed. In this condemned cell, there were two grill doors beside the prison door. To this day, the memory of that bunch of keys, the clicking, the noise they, they would deliberately make in the stillness and solitude of uh, a prison life. You, you actually felt they were hitting the inner core of your soul. They never switched off the light. I had this floodlight, night and day. I lost track of time. These particular orders who always brought my food would open the cell door and I could hear someone outside putting the food down. And uh, she would stand right at the entrance to the cell. They would then take the bucket, the sanitary bucket, and turn the lid upside down and put your plate of food on that. And she would stand right at the cell door and kick the food in, kick it into the cell. The mind finds it very difficult to adjust to such solitude. It is such utter torture that I, I could feel that um, my mind was, was so tortured with lack of doing something and not communicating with anyone, that um, I would find myself talking, talking to the children. I would think I am thinking about them and actually find myself in the end conducting conversations with my children as if they are with me in the same. It becomes so difficult to keep saying with absolutely nothing to do that I would actually hunt for ants. If uh, I had an ant in the cell or a fly, then I would regard myself as having company for the day. When I was given anything, if anything at all, it was the Bible. One day this sunny pool stood at the cell door and flung the Bible at my face and he threw it and said there you are pray pray so that your god can get you out of this set while in solitary winnie mandela underwent intensive interrogation under the direction of police colonel swanipole he was the one who murdered a lot of my people behind bars he was actually the horror of pretoria central i was interrogated right through day and night, for seven days and seven nights. Uh, as they changed the teams, uh, Sonny Poole would rub his hands and say he is waiting for that moment 
when they shall break me completely. By the time they interrogated me, um, I, they, they knew everything. They knew uh, all about uh, my political activities at the time. And the African National Congress, of course, was a banned organization, which meant that whatever political activities I was involved in at that time were underground uh, political activities. There was nothing they didn't know. They had managed to break um, a few of those they had interrogated before me. The body devises its own defensive mechanisms. I didn't know it was such relief to faint, for instance. And during the only moment I ever had any rest from the intensive interrogation and intensive questioning, where your, your, your mind just loses track of everything, uh, while during those uh, fainting spells, they were so relieving. I could recover, and uh, from each fainting spell, when I came round, I felt a little refreshed to face more and more interrogation. On the seventh day, I started urinating uh, blood, and the body was swollen like a balloon. Um, I don't know the medical explanation for that. Whether it's because of sitting in, in, in one position uh, for days and nights right through. But uh, my legs, for instance, were as if they were just poles that were not part of my body. I could actually feel the weight so swollen, so odimous they were that I found it difficult to stand. And um, that didn't stop my interrogators in any way. I don't remember when, how I was brought back to the cell. I found myself just there on Sunday. Uh, in the end, the fainting spells were much more acute. I think as the body was beginning to give in um, to that type of brutality prior to my detention. I knew that as a mother and as a social worker, um, life, a human being, was so sacrosanct that I could never on my own lift up a finger against any human being for ideological reasons. But what I went through, that personal experience hardened me so much that at the end of my interrogation, looking at my interrogators and what I had gone through, I knew that as I sat in that cell, in that cell, if my own father or my brother walked in dangling a gun and he was on the other side, and I had a gun too in my hand in defense of the ideals for which I was being tortured then out fire. The security branch had made me the soldier at heart I am today. There was no way that uh, you could talk any language of peace to vicious men who treated defenseless women and children in that manner. I realized then that the Africana had closed the chapter of negotiation and that the decision taken by my leaders in 1962 could, was arrived at with difficulty, but that there was no other way the decision to defend our honor, the decision to stop taming the biblical other chick, the white man, had hit us for too long. Our patience had 
had been tested and had endured for too long. I knew then that somehow there had to be a political crisis in this country for us to reach the ultimate goal. That is what I imagined as in 1969, 1970, during my months of solitary confinement. The charges against Winnie and her co-defendants were dismissed. She was jailed again, and arrested, and again arrested. Mandela wrote to her, Although I always try to put up a brave face, I never get used to you being in the cooler. Few things disorganize my whole life as much as this particular type of hardship, which seems destined to stalk us for quite some time still. Mandela was particularly concerned about Winnie's courage, which at times seemed to him to be reckless. In 1975, for a brief period, Winnie was completely free. Immediately, she resumed public political activity. Her ban had expired. She had been banned for 14 years. So we organized a tremendous meeting, jam-packed, at which all of us spoke. And then we were at the airport leaving Winnie. And a reporter said to me, that's Jimmy Kruger there. And I said, who's he? And he said, that's the Minister of Justice and prisons. So I said to Winnie, Winnie, look, we can go and have some fun and games now. We went up to the car. Uh, this little man, his head was still in the trunk. He was taking out some suitcases. So I went up to him and I said, uh, Mr. Kruger. So he took his head off out of the you know, trunk, very delighted, broad smile said, yes, you know, very happy he had been identified by a member of the public. I said, I'd like you to meet uh, Mrs. Mandela. I don't believe you have met her. So still the smile was on his face and his oh, hand sort of stretched out. And Winnie straight away said to him, when are you releasing my husband? You know, quite sternly. And uh, he wagged his little finger at her and said, that's up to you. So she turns back to me and she laughs. She says, listen to him. My husband's destiny is in my hands. By jailing Mandela and other leaders for life, by destroying new leadership whenever it rose up, the South African government believed it could hold back the tide of democracy in South Africa. The spontaneous revolt of 1976 took it by surprise. Over there is the school where um, the explosion took place, that is when 1976 erupted. When over 10,000 children demonstrated in the street there, out of school. And uh, this direction, that is uh, where the uh, police camped. It was more of a war situation. That was a military zone and the government, the security forces were that side and the school children were this side. We saw 1976, the tragedy of our country. Any mother who saw that would not wish to see that again. The bloodbath we went through, collecting our children's bodies from the street because they dared oppose the Africana. Together with a number of others, Winnie was accused of plotting the Soweto uprising, a charge later dismissed. Although Winnie was already banned, the police raided her house. It happened ever so suddenly at about three one morning. The cops, they broke the door down. They took my mother off to a police station. Then after a few hours, a big truck arrived and they just started loading things. Then they, they took me and the big truck to the police station and my mother was told then that she was, should be moved to Grandfort and were just taken there. It was quite shocking, you know. Without any charge or warning, Winnie Mandela had been banished 250 miles from her home in Soweto. Her place of exile was Branford in the Orange Free State. The Orange Free State is the most rigidly conservative of South African provinces, the heartland of Afrikanerdom. The unrest that periodically rocked the rest of the country did not cause a tremor here. 
But when he tucked away in what she called her little Siberia, the government must have thought it could forget about her. Firstly, I had to overcome the depressing aspect of Brantford and decide in my mind that wherever there are my people, my ministry, my own crusade against the party goes on. The local people had been warned that Winnie was a dangerous subversive. She began to build from the grassroots in those areas of greatest need for the community. Food for the elderly, a daycare center for the children, a mobile clinic, kitchen gardens. Small victories that won the confidence and respect of Brantford's black community. Winnie said Grishama. As was there, or can no only gender be the Grishamos. Winnie was not near, no, that you Grish had. Winning is really very amazing. Um, there she is, banished to Brantford, a godforsaken place, a place where the Africana, I think very little of an African. To them, an African is someone that is there, that has been put in this world to serve them and work for them. So she gets there, and um, she revolutionizes the whole place. And she enters the shops where normally black people are not allowed to go. <laughs> With the result that the Africaners in Brantford wanted her to be moved from Brentford as a place of banishment to be taken to another place because they were saying that since we came to Brentford uh, the Kepas were becoming very chiefly and of course the other people seeing the way she's fighting the system and the oppression they start taking it from her you know it becomes infectious Winnie's grassroots organizing built a base for the African National Congress in the Orange Free State. Journalists and statesmen from all over the world made the journey to this out-of-the-way spot to visit Winnie. In 1982, without explanation, Mandela was moved from Robben Island to the mainland prison of Polesmoor. When not in prison herself, Winnie visits him once a month. She's always tailed by the security police. One of the most painful experiences is to give the prison your back and return back home, knowing fully well that uh, you are leaving him there for life as far as those who have jailed him think. It needs quite a man to retain your spirit behind bars. Throughout the years, visits to him have been a tremendous source of inspiration. Nelson writes regularly from his prison to Winnie and hers. If on my return I found you away from home, I'd seek you out and report to you first, for that honor is yours and yours alone. No one else has or will ever have it from me, and it would shame me for life if I ever surrendered it to any other person. Many of the letters have been seized in police raids. Only a few survive. Your beautiful photo still stands about two feet above my left shoulder as I write this note. I dust it carefully every morning, for to do so gives me the pleasant feeling that I'm caressing you as in the old days. I even touch your nose with mine to recapture the electric carrot that used to flush through my blood whenever I did so. In August 1985, while Winnie was on a visit to her doctor in Johannesburg, her house in Brantford was raided by the police and later firebombed. This was the government's own version of a prison without walls, a prison outside prison. Winnie's visit to the house where she had lived in exile for nine years was watched by a police helicopter. 
my legal advisors will have to see to it that the government restores the prison it gave me to a livable situation and that they restore all what they have destroyed except that of course uh, items that were in here were invaluable they were priceless and they cannot be replaced what sort of things were those uh, of family things that of sentimental value who do you think then was responsible for burning it down it is the south african government through the police through the uh, security branch they simply just came back to uh, complete the job they did uh, last week when they invaded the house and attacked several children who ran into the yard for protection. During the police attack, Winnie's sister was beaten unconscious. Winnie's grandson lay tear gassed for two hours. The police claimed that gasoline bombs were being made in the house. And they had to create that kind of atmosphere present us as a violent people who were manufacturing bombs in the backfield of, uh, of, of the free state. Through the years, I did develop sentiments about the place. I engaged myself heavily, numerous projects for the community. Uh, in a way, it became a livable prison, uh, which was a point of departure for me to serve my people where I had been placed without any choice. Um, the feeling I have is the feeling of everyone else who has suffered such losses um, which have been inflicted by the racist regime. It is painful. It is the reality of our struggle for freedom. And it is only a continuation of the physical participation and the physical suffering of any freedom fighter. Are you going to keep right on struggling? The struggle goes on. There has never been any doubt about that. In the surge of unrest that has swept South Africa since 1984, 15 people were killed by police bullets and gas in the township of Mamelodi. Defying government orders to return to exile in Brantford and under the forbidden banner of the African National Congress, when he broke her band to make a speech at the funeral. I bring you messages of love from our leaders inside prisons. I bring you deep sympathy from the family who share with you the pain of our country. Pretoria has failed to rule our country. We are here as testimony to the fact that the solution to this country's problem lies in this black hand. This is our country. In the same way uh, you have had to bury our loved ones, our children today. So shall the blood of these little heroes we bury today be avenged. <laughs> we are here today to tell you that that day is not far when we shall lead you to freedom. Am I answer?
Yeah.